You don't have to be an activist to know that something has to change. The huge amount of meat we consume accelerates climate change, endangers our health, and causes billions of animals to suffer. Only a small minority of people believe that everything in the meat industry is fine, and just one-fifth of people are opposed to a complete ban on factory farming. But humans are fickle. Most of us are deeply affected when we see images of animals in distress. A part of us feels like him. We hear dying pigs screaming and demand change immediately. But another part of us reacts just like people on the other side. The steak tastes a little worse today, but still far too tasty to do without. So how are we supposed to change the world when we can hardly change ourselves? I'm Rosa, and once I picked up a chicken. I'm Julian, and I saw someone get spit on by a llama. Project day at a Berlin school. I'm Ruben, and I held a little baby goat in my arms. Class 5B will spend the day looking at the relationship between humans and animals. My grandma's neighbor has very cute rabbits, and they always nibble on our sleeves. <laughs> Yes, very nice. I'm Friederike, and I once put sunscreen on a little pig. Friederike Schmitz is convinced young people are the key to changing the conditions in livestock farming. My goal isn't to convince you of my opinion or something. It's about you getting information and thinking for yourself what you think. She sees children as future consumers, young citizens who will one day choose the kind of society they want to live in. My hope is that we will abolish livestock farming in this country or in industrialized countries, and that we will do so in the next few years or decades. Whether that's realistic? I always find that a funny question, because it's just not at all realistic to go on as we are now. We are in the middle of a climate crisis. Of course, we have to completely transform society in order to have any chance of continuing to live reasonably well here on this planet. They start with two big circles. If it's a need that pigs and humans have, then you can sort of hang that here in the middle. After just a few cards, it becomes apparent that it's the middle that fills up the fastest. Finding needs that differentiate humans from pigs is harder than expected. Notice anything? Anything you would change? Curiosity should come in the middle. And the rest of you? Is it something pigs want too, or just humans? Indeed, pigs are very curious, even more curious than dogs. First, students see what pigs who are left to themselves will do. <laughs> then comes the inevitable contrast. At various stations, the children explore how pigs actually live when they're farmed. Must that be bad? That's totally... They try out how much space they would have as farmed piglets. Can you guys back up if you want? No. They learn that sows are kept in pens they can't turn around in for weeks, and that most piglets only live a few months. So how do you think that feels for the pigs? If we were trapped there, I think we would have killed ourselves in the barn if we know that we're going to die anyway in the next few years. There's no way to show it neutrally. 
As soon as you show reality, you need to choose information. Maybe we choose the more negative information instead of the positive. We don't say that the pigs... I mean, it's hard to find any positive information. We don't say the piglets have it nice and cosy under the heat lamp. That's what the Farmers' Association says. We say the piglets can nurse from their mother, but the mother can't take care of them, and they are taken away after a few weeks. They can never get outside. They can't root around in the ground. They never bathe in a stream. They can only take a few steps back and forth and never walk across a field. We choose this negative information because it's relevant for ethical reflection. Yes, if everything were wonderful, we wouldn't need to talk about it at all. But we need to talk about the problems. There are many people who decide not to eat meat for these reasons. And there are many people who still eat meat, even though many of them know how the animals are doing. What could their reasons be? Well, I do a lot of sports at home. I have a fitness trainer, and I need that for my diet. So I need the iron that's in meat. Because I think it's delicious. We buy a lot of meat, but only organic. We eat it at our grandma's, and it's kind of a tradition when we're at grandma's. Tradition, great. I would say public opinion is shifting in such a way that it's becoming clearer and clearer that livestock farming can't go on like this. Of course, most people still eat meat, but at the same time, most people have also understood there's a problem with that. I thought it was really hard to watch. I had always thought at organic pig farms there was much more space, and they took much more care of the animals. But it was also very frightening how little is done for a pig. And now you see that many animals are also tortured. So I try to eat less meat. I just thought it was stupid. I didn't know that before. The story behind it. But now we know it. At lunchtime, the salami stays in the lunchbox. But Friederike Schmitz knows people who grow up in a world of animal products don't change their habits in a day. I do believe it moves the children somehow. And there's a lasting effect. A few thoughts, a few seeds have been sown, something's been triggered. Yet at the same time, we also notice in the workshops how powerful habit can be. On the one hand, children are totally shocked about how badly the pigs are kept on farms. But later, when it comes to whether or not to eat meat, for many of them, the most they can do is to try and eat less meat. Of course, I'd like to see more committed reactions. So it's not just that I think it's a shame what the children often say at the end, measured against my own opinions, but measured against what they themselves said two hours earlier. They simply can't imagine at that moment that they could no longer eat meat. It's not in the realm of possibility for them. Nevertheless, Friederike Schmitz believes in the power of a good argument. We all like to think that a good argument could make us change our habits. But how much we are affected by these arguments depends a great deal on context. Psychologists have found that people consider animals to be less morally relevant if they've been given meat to eat before the interview. Eating animals and at the same time recognizing them morally leads to cognitive dissonance in our minds. And to avoid it, our opinion adjusts to our behavior. In another study, participants who were told they would soon meet a homeless person who needed their help preferred to hear the most unemotional version of his life possible. On the other hand, those who did not know they would meet him in person were much more interested in the emotional details of his life. It is the same impulse we have when we avoid eye contact with someone begging on the street. Science has a name for this effect, empathy avoidance. Yeah. Welcome. Friedrich Mölln has been working for 27 years 
to make sure we remain empathetic. Thank you all for being here. We're here to talk about this issue. And I think I'm not alone in being outraged by it. His animal rights organization, Soko Tierschutz, raises public awareness of abuses in industrial farming. What happened here has unfortunately brought out something I need to say again and again. I wouldn't have thought I'd ever see this extent of violence towards a helpless animal. This time, it's about cows. Sick animals are said to have been illegally slaughtered at a nearby slaughterhouse. Secretly filmed footage shows emaciated cattle, called downer cows, being pushed across the floor one after the other. When they don't move, an employee beats them. If you look here now, you can see the animal collapsed at some point. People who came to the activists' meeting can hardly believe this happened in their neighborhood. Unfortunately, we need to see this in full detail. It's very important. Now he comes with a bolt gun and fires it. He's got a knife and a gun. Now the throat is slit. Companies usually keep this hidden. Video cameras, high fences, barbed wire, security services, dogs. They use all means to hide what they're doing. So, I developed a strategy. Okay, you need a different approach. You must document it secretly, undercover, like Valraf. You have to sneak in there and inform people so they can form an opinion. They should be ashamed of themselves. Who is that? Where does he live? Of course, we have to protect their right to privacy, even the rights of wrongdoers, because it won't help anyone if people try to take revenge. It's a whole system, a dairy industry that systematically wrecks animals. Friedrich Mölln sees the same patterns repeatedly, both of animal treatment and our reactions to it. For example, the issue of sick cows. The people say, of course, that's extreme, but they fail to understand this is a whole system. It all goes together. The conditions the cows are kept in are so bad. The animals must maximize milk yields. They're overbred. Their lives are short. They get sick and injured quickly and become downer cows. The downer cows are simply the other side of the dairy industry and its problems. On one hand, they produce milk. On the other, they end up with downer cows. After the meeting, the images stay in people's minds. Many don't want to go home right away. A spontaneous vigil starts in front of a butcher shop. But make a commitment. Try to get out of this system. Because people always tell me later, yes, I found a butcher I trust, and it's much better, and it's organic and all the rest. But it's just a never-ending cycle. Always the same, over and over. People are screaming for vigilante justice on Facebook. We have to hang him. We should drown him. The harshest punishment you can give these people is buying broccoli. The goal isn't to shut down individual slaughterhouses. By the way, I've got to say, you guys are really great. They want to chip away at societal support for the industry. And that's where everybody can contribute. I became a vegan when I was 13. I just said, I don't want that. And that's why I can sleep at night, even though I see this junk all day. Even when people write to me on Facebook saying, it's also terrible, and I have to cry all night. I don't have to cry for the animals, I mourn for the animals. But I also know this isn't happening to feed me. Friedrich Mölln not only went vegan at a young age, he knew early he wanted to make animal advocacy his job. He started in a large animal protection organization. Das war aber halt keine Tierrechtsorganisation. But it wasn't an animal rights organization. They also say, we want a world without animal suffering. But for them, that means changing, easing, or reducing animal exploitation. That's how it was. I negotiated with supermarket chains and farmers. Oh, yes, 
And how many square centimetres can you give the animal? What's the right conditions for keeping rabbits? Space for two hops or four? I negotiated terms for quality assurance labels too. Say, for geese. What's okay, what's not okay, and what's absolutely forbidden. I learned from that experience. You quickly end up in a bubble. These people aren't monsters, as many animal rights activists like to write on Facebook. These are friendly, nice people. Supermarket chain managers, poultry and meat company executives. And they know very well which buttons they can press with you. They push them on me, too. And I went along with it for years. We're all familiar with such promises from supermarket packaging. Here, the German Animal Welfare Federation advertised its animal welfare label. Das ist Paula. This is Paula. Paula has a new boyfriend. Today the two want to have dinner together for the first time. Paula is in the mood for a schnitzel, or chicken. Her boyfriend doesn't like that at all, because he's very fond of animals. It upsets him that chickens must lead a sad life in cramped spaces until they're slaughtered. Paula counters that there are now animal welfare labels. They guarantee the animals have been allowed more space. Basic holding conditions allow no more than 17 chickens per square meter. No more than 17 chickens per square meter. That means less than the size of a standard page of paper for each chicken. I went along with this for a long time. I set boundaries repeatedly and crossed them again and again. Fortunately, I got to the point where I said, OK, that's the last red line. When they come up with another embarrassing seal of approval that actually does nothing for the animals, then I'm gone. I quit on Christmas Eve 2012. When I walked out, it was certainly one of the happiest moments of my life, because I just left it all behind. Suddenly, I saw very clearly again, there's the goal. The goal is the complete abolition of livestock farming. Gruesome factory farming images from a large Bavarian dairy farm. Extremely gory images from a fattening facility near Dilling. The images are horrifying. Severely injured animals with open wounds, pigs eating each other. Is this farm an isolated case, or must we expect more cases to emerge? Is this the exception? But Eburg, Animal rights activists are filming with hidden cameras. Police are investigating accusations of animal cruelty. Selm, Aschaffenburg. That the animal welfare scandal could have taken place in a small community of 2,000 people is something many villagers cannot imagine. In a brazen move, animal rights activists mounted several cameras in the municipal slaughterhouse. Tauberbischofsheim, What they call sedated is really a terrible struggle to the death. Kulmbach. This isn't just a black sheep, it's a herd, because your normalcy is in fact a state of emergency. In this forest in Belgium, several dozen rescued animals live with activist Tobias Lehnert. Turkey likes to look at himself in the mirror. He's always there mirroring himself. In terms of cases in the world, moral cases, it's, harder to, it's hard to find any case that can be made better than the case for veganism. I think I'm, I'm unsure about so many things in the world. I see black and white everywhere. But, and that's maybe what attracted me to this, to this field, is that in, in, in this case, I think I see a lot of clarity. I think I see, I see very few strong arguments to keep eating animals. And certainly I see none for treating animals the way that we do. There, there are no arguments, no, no rational, no arguments that make sense. But still, these arguments don't have the power to convince most people. And of course, that's, that is very frustrating for, for activists and for people who want to create this change. And so, yeah, rather than, than studying more and, and, and studying all these arguments and all these facts, you know, these facts are not going to sell this idea. His goal is the same as that of Friederike Schmitz and Friedrich Mölln, but he believes there's a different way to achieve it. You know, there was a study among uh, moral philosophers, professors in ethics, 
and um, they asked these professors, uh, do you think that the eating of animals, the killing and eating of animals can be morally justified? Even though the study found that ethicists who thought meat eating was morally wrong were clearly in the majority, less than half of them were vegetarians. In general, the philosophers, even though they spent all day making moral arguments, when it comes to their actions, they're no different than other people. They don't donate more money or blood. They check in with their mothers just as rarely, and they leave their trash lying around just as often. What you see there is, is an example of this attitude-behavior gap. They have the right attitude, they have the right ideas, the right information, but still this, this didn't translate into the right um, behavior. So what I'm saying is that, that we can also focus on the opposite thing. We can make sure that people change their behavior, and that is by providing them with products that are just so great that they don't need any argument or reason to taste them except that they're good, and then make them forget about what they loved so much. And, and the moment they have a really good vegan taste experience, the thing is that they become a lot more open to the arguments for veganism. In our actual dealings with people and animals, we make ethical decisions differently than in the abstract minds of philosophers. Our reason isn't like a judge who impartially weighs the facts and decides. It's more like a lawyer who looks for arguments to defend our behavior. Tobias Lenat says that when we no longer feel defensive, we'll find the same arguments more convincing. We like to think that when we abolished slavery, that was just because of moral outrage. That was just because people were like fed up and they said like, we can't treat our, our brothers and sisters like this. Um, we like to believe that was the only reason. And that was certainly part of the reason it's important. This moral outreach against injustice is important. But there were also other more pragmatic, more mundane re reasons. Like this was also the time of the um, industrial revolution. And so the, the steam engine was invented. And um, it could be so in certain cases that uh, an, an automatized solution, a machine, was cheaper than slaves. So you can imagine a slaveholder saying like, okay, I have this alternative, I don't need my slaves anymore. And we would say, certainly now today, well, that guy is, 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 is an asshole, right? Because now that he has a solution, he's going to uh, release his slaves. He should have done it much earlier. But pragmatically, we, we can be happy that, that this solution is there and it helps people and that, that maybe afterwards it helped these people realize, yeah, well, actually, this is wrong. We're at Anuga in Cologne. It's the biggest food trade fair in the world, with exhibitors from 98 countries. All the big meat companies are represented here. Manufacturers proudly present their latest products. But among the enormous booths for companies featuring meat, you can find more and more vegetarian and vegan alternatives. Hi there. Hi. Uh, you would like to try something meatless? Yeah. Are they vegan? It's totally vegan. Okay. What, what's the basis? It's made from peas. Peas, okay. Yeah. Peas are made. Yeah. Do you like it? Yeah. Yeah. Good texture. Even though there are increasingly better alternatives to animal proteins, Tobias Lenat doesn't think we should urge everyone to become vegans right away. Research shows that people only try to change when they believe they can actually sustain that change. Some people would say, like, I could never least leave cheese. And I would just say, like, I mean, yeah, just try that. I mean, leave out, keep eating the cheese and, and do all the rest. Because if you say like, well, yeah, it's all or nothing, and, and no, you have to give up cheese too because cheese is horrible for the animals, etc. Chances are that they, they're not going to do anything. So, so, so there's a saying, if you ask for all or nothing, what you usually get is nothing. It's not about 1% um, of people doing it something perfectly. It's about millions of people doing something imperfectly. Even just two people who only eat meat on the weekends would together have a greater effect than one vegetarian. And for Tobias Lenat, the only thing that counts is the thing that works. I remember being in a hotel. Uh, it was with a group of social change makers, but they were not vegetarian or vegan. And uh, I had to give a talk uh, about my topic. And then the organizers asked, like, 
okay, who's going to eat vegan, um, who's going to order a vegan dish tonight? And they all put their hands up. And I said, no, no, please, because I had eaten in that hotel the night before and it was terrible. The vegan food was terrible. So, so I didn't want them to, I, I wanted them to eat meat <laughs> that night because the worst thing that, the, 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 yeah, enemy number one is bad vegan food. Uh, if you give people that, they get confirmed in their prejudices and, and we're just further away from it than ever. For him, the path to a time after meat will mean decades of gradual developments and many compromises. You have to dare to break your own rules. Pragmatism, in a way, is a testimony to how much you want to achieve those ideals. You want to be, you want to sacrifice some things, you want to sacrifice some some idealistic principles to get there. Uh, and you don't look at your own personal purity. Tastefully honest tradition. Hello, sir. Hi. Is something I can explain? So you are... So you're filming for a few minutes now? Yeah, they are um, uh, making documentary on, on the future of food yeah. for uh, Arte uh, yeah. TV channel. Uh, so I was wondering, you, you guys are traditionally a meat company, but you're also getting into vegetarian, vegan products? Yeah. What's your opinion on it? I think it's very good. Okay, um, yeah. I think You're going to make that, uh, alliances with um, people and parties, uh, stakeholders, that uh, don't necessarily have the same ideas of you, that um, um, will um, go part of the way with you, but not all the way. Yeah. Okay, thank you. All right, thank you. We have to accept that there's going to be imperfections. One thing I like to say is that a new system has to be built with money from the old system. You know, um, it may seem very unfair that all these big food companies, they, they acquired so much money by, yeah, killing animals and, and selling animal products. And now then they're going to like also make a profit with these alternatives now that they see that they're profitable. That is something that seems very unjust and almost infuriating. Um, but I, I'm afraid there is no other way. When Tobias Leinart imagines the future, he sees a slow but clear path to becoming meat-free. More and more people reduce their meat consumption and opt for alternatives. The growing demand finances new innovations. Meat alternatives improve, causing even more demand. It's a self-reinforcing system. When you have an identical product that's the same taste and the same bite and maybe lower priced at some point and a lower environmental impact and no animal suffering, why would somebody at that point say, no, I want my meat to come from a dead animal? To the Tobias Lehnert says the point of no return will be when meat eating becomes just as socially unacceptable as smoking in a restaurant or driving a car without a seatbelt. In the first stage, um, plant-based will become a norm. It will become the default. And then from there, there will be more and more people going further and further until the people eating animal products, producing animal products will become at some point a minority. It will become much more expensive to do that. At some point, it might become illegal. So I'm convinced that in years to come, in decades to come, we will look back on this period and wonder what the hell we were doing with animals as food. Thank you very much. There are idealists and pragmatists in every social movement. Pragmatists like Tobias Lehnert demand less of us than other activists. That's why this approach may at first seem kinder. But you could say activists like Friedrich Möhn have a more positive image of humanity. They believe we can change of our own accord. We make your yeah. summer barbecue. Super. Super. That's why the great meat debate ends at this abandoned slaughterhouse in southern Germany. After being exposed by Soko Tierschutz, this operation had to close. Of course, it's a good feeling not to hear the dreadful screams of the pigs that came out of the pens there, and to be rid of this horrible stench that came from blood, guts and more than a little fear at this slaughterhouse. Now it's a nice, peaceful place. Perfect, if a few trees would grow out of the roof. 
but that could take some time. It's just been announced the slaughterhouse is reopening. It's always like Sisyphus. You roll the stone up the hill, and then it immediately rolls down again, and you think, ah, I can't roll that back up again. But we've been doing it for decades, and I just say at some point, the hill will be gone. There's a fascinating theory in anthropology. Two million years ago, our ancestors started eating meat. In order to be able to hunt together in groups, cooperative behavior became increasingly important. Anticipating exactly what the group expected of us developed into an evolutionary advantage. This has become a part of us, a conscience that tells us what is right and what is wrong. So in a way, the desire for meat gave us the ability to think morally in the first place. And ironically, there is much evidence today to suggest that this ability to think morally will lead us, two million years later, to leave our desire for meat behind.